Okay, no big long openings. You know all the jazz. Tumblr, Patreon, Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Bandcamp. Like them, learn them, love them. They are your friends. We're going to jump right into part two of The Factory, recording 741. Yes, folks, this is part two, so if you missed part one, go back and listen to that. It's available on this channel and everywhere else. If you choose not to, that's up to you, but you're going to be confused and not know what's going on. And as always, we remind you that our audio dramas are best listened to on headphones. All right, let's go. Club 40 Audio presents... The Factory. It was nearly three weeks after I had ended my official involvement in the Leech affair. The Leech business had been overshadowed by a number of stories. Stories of shocking and brutal murder. Leech was a suspect at first, but very soon he was disregarded. The Leech killings, if that's indeed what they had been, were subtle affairs. Leech had killed discreetly, with some means that left the bodies relatively undamaged, either by strangulation or suffocation. Two of them, including the murder of the Carter girl, had been broken necks. They were made to look as if the girls had fallen down a long flight of stairs. That's what made them so hard to determine as murders in the first place. These murders were different. They were messy. When you came upon them, there was no doubt as to what they were. The strange sweep of light is that a plague the hills of Hollywood continued tonight. The victim was an older gentleman by the name of Anthony Fletcher. He was found in the middle of the community of Pasadena. His body completely devoid of bodily fluid, and his throat and face were severely damaged. The man was only able to be identified by the contents of his wallet and his dark brown trench coat. This is the fifth such murder in recent days, all following the same modus operandi. The tabloids have named the perpetrator of these killings the Night Ripper. So far, the police have no leads as to who the killer might be. Mr. Fletcher, until recently, was a resident of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and moved out to Hollywood for his retirement to assist his youngest daughter in her attempts at a film career. He is survived by his daughter, Emily, and his wife, Agatha. There would be three more murders by the Night Ripper, and then they suddenly ceased, for the last was the worst and the strangest. The man was known to be a two-bit hood. He even had a moniker in the underworld, Little Boy McGee. Little Boy whose first name had actually been Sean, was anything but Little. Just like the guy in the Robin Hood story, the name was ironic. Little boy was six foot five, 300 pounds or more. He was built as though someone had fashioned a man out of a California redwood. Did you hear about McGee? It says here in the paper he was found dead in an alley last night, not too far from the Chinese. I think it might be one of the Ripper murders. I would have thought you'd need a chainsaw to take down a man like McGee. From the sound of it, that's almost what happened. You're kidding. Uh, the paper said he was all torn up. His torso was ripped to shreds. Someone saw the man who did it, said it was a little fella, couldn't have been more than 5'6", five, 5'8", five, at most. Uh, but the oddest bit was the way the body was mangled. It wasn't done with knives or a weapon of any kind. Uh, the coroner and those in the scene said it looked more like an animal attack than a murder. Said the throat was torn out, as was the midsection, and there was what looked like claw marks all over the body. But they're pretty sure it was actually made by human fingernails. Are you done with that paper? I'd like to read the story for myself. Sure, you can have it. All but the funny pages. I want those for my boy. He loves those little orphan Annie strips. But I already told you everything that was in it. About that story, anyway. Now, if you ask me, I'm betting whatever took down McGee was a reefer fiend. That stuff can do all kinds of crazy things to your mind. I saw that one movie and just one part. Bill was right. He had told me nearly everything the paper had to say. But still, it wouldn't leave me alone. The Chinese. Right down the street from the El Capitan. 
very close to where I had seen a man dragged away into the night by something the size and shape of a human. Now this. It was too much coincidence. I decided to go back to the El Capitan and see what befell. I gotten lucky once before. Maybe I will get lucky again. Well, I went there again that night, and the night after, and for two nights after that. Every time I picked a person to follow, anyone who rubbed me the wrong way. But nothing happened. Not one thing. Not one shadow moved when it shouldn't have. Not one strange sound in the night. I must have been picking the wrong guys, too, because none of them did anything wrong either. I began to wonder if I was losing my touch. Meanwhile, the Ripper murders had ceased. It seemed like whoever had killed Fletcher, Little Boy, and the rest had gotten enough and moved on to greener pastures. It made my nightly action seem rather useless. I was just about to give up on my little quest when another story turned up in the paper. This was about a local businessman who had gone missing. No body, no throat ripped out, no scandal, just gone. He had been missing for almost two days. No one in the organization knew where he was, and when you deal with the kind of money he had, that sort of thing just isn't done. There was a reward out for any information on him. I was getting low on the dough again, and I had no new cases coming my way. So I could use the money, and I figured, what's the worst that could happen? The last place anyone had seen him, Eldridge was the guy's name. The last time anyone had seen Eldridge, it was at Chasen's Southern Pit, in the company of a beautiful woman. That was all the detail it gave. A beautiful woman. Well, that could describe most of the women in Hollywood, so that wasn't much to go on. Chasen's was a restaurant any Joe could get a table at. Little more than a shack, really, but its chili was fantastic. Hardly the kind of a place you'd expect a big mucky muck to hang out. But that was the funny thing. It had been put together by a friend of Frank Capra's, and if it was good enough for Mr. Capra, it seemed it was good enough for Hollywood land. Every name you ever heard of could be found there from time to time, from Shirley Temple to Walt Disney himself. It was said that while Walt was putting the final touches on Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, he and his staff would stay up all night pounding down bowls of chastened chili. But of course, that was just a rumor. So I turned up at Chasen's and thought I would check out the scene. Well, it turned out the place had gotten a little swankier since I had last been there. There was a line outside the door. So maybe it was becoming more of a draw than I remembered. Once I got inside, I found out the prices were higher too. They'd started offering fancy cheeses and caviar on the menu. The southern pit was gone from the name and the signs outside. And on the menu. Now it was just Chasen's. Maybe this was the kind of place Eldridge would frequent after all. I sat down at the bar and ordered a cup of coffee. At least that was still relatively cheap. I did some people watching. It was hard to know what to look for with most of the fellows wearing fancy suits and the ladies dressed in evening gowns. But then I spotted a woman I had seen before. She was a tall, cool, raven-haired beauty with high cheekbones and a strong jaw. She was one of those ladies that you wouldn't mind looking at in a still photograph but no still photo could do her justice. When she was alive and moving, she was sex on legs. And the legs weren't bad either. I had a feeling that when she walked down the street, dogs would sit up and beg, and traffic would come to a screeching halt. She had a face that was made for the pictures. If I had been an agent or a big movie mogul, I would have swooped her up in a second and had the biggest payday of my life. A payday that would have kept paying for the next 20 years or more. But because that wasn't my racket, I could only sit there and stare at her. I had seen her two nights before at the El Capitan. She'd been with some big fella that I didn't like the looks of. But she seemed to be quite comfortable with him, and so I had assumed they'd been going steady for quite some time. But now, she was here, at Chasen's, with another man. When I had seen her before at the movies, she'd been wearing a simple white blouse with a flower pinned to the collar along with a short skirt that just barely covered her calves. She looked as though she might have just stepped off a school bus a few hours before. But now, here, huh, she could have made Marlena Dietrich feel a modest. 
The red dress she wore was silky and caught the light in a wavy sheen. And the skirt, the skirt was cut well above the knee. Her hair, tied up in a ponytail the first time I had noticed her, was now a cascading waterfall running down her shoulders to the middle of her back. I watched her, mesmerized. I hoped she was alone. I hoped that I might be able to get her attention. I hoped she had a thing for rugged men and fedoras and three days of stubble. But she wasn't alone. Is a beautiful woman ever alone? Especially in a restaurant or at the movies? I'll save you the guesswork. The answer is no. She sat down at the table of a mook that would have made Mortimer Schnurd look like Valentino by comparison. I couldn't have told you for the life of me what she saw in the guy. Except maybe he had a lot of money laid by he wasn't spending. His suit, if you can believe it, was shabbier than mine. I haven't had a new suit since before the market crashed. And he wasn't all that good looking either. The other guy I'd seen her with at the movies could have been pulled off the stage in the middle of playing Romeo. The stage, mind you, not the silver screen. He'd looked good enough from a distance, but this guy, well, the simplest explanation I can give you is to go back to Mr. Capra. He'd made a movie a few years back about some Joe Dokes who inherited a couple million dollars. And the guy that came to Mandrake Falls to tell him about it was a guy named Cobb. I only remember that because Gary Cooper made some wisecrack about the guy saying, Poor Cobb's out of a job, or something like that. Well, Cobb was played by an actor named Lionel Stander, and that's who this guy reminded me of. Right down to his voice. I tell you, baby, you and me were going to have the time of our lives. You hear me? The time of our lives, I said. When we finish up here, we're going to go to a little place I know where they make the best bathtub gin you ever had. Bathtub gin, huh? You know it's not illegal to drink anymore. Why don't we get a few bottles of the good stuff so we don't have to worry about going blind before we finish our cocktails? Ah, sure. That stuff is for sissy, sweetheart. The stuff they make at my little joint, <laughs> that'll put hair on your chest. I'm game if you are, sweet cheeks. And you're into that kind of thing. <laughs> That's my kind of girl. You and me, baby. You and me. I needed this kind of an evening out. It's been so long. I needed to find a nice guy, like you. You're gonna need me even more a little later tonight. You just don't know it yet. You're gonna need me even more a little later tonight. You just don't know it yet. How does a guy get away with lines like that? If I'd said something half as salacious to any of the dames I've known on a first date, they would have slapped me in the face and left me holding the tab. And rightfully so, I suppose. But no. She just leaned right on into him and gave him a wet, slow smacker. The two of them sat there chatting, Jack pounding down whatever he could get his hands on, while the girl sat there picking out a piece of garlic bread or two. She was affectionate. Real affectionate. But some women are just like that, I suppose. And yes, it occurred to me that I might have been watching something of the oldest profession at work, but I know those women. I can spot them a mile away. And this girl, she wasn't one of them. I tell you, baby, my boss, he ain't the kind of man to suffer fools lightly. Then how are you still working for him? He tells us he's always looking for some bright young talent to help us at the farm. He goes through the training process, not all of them makes it, but after a couple months, the good ones come back to us and work in the office. Then if he's really good, oh, the boss, he takes them to meet with some of the big muckety mucks he knows in the pictures. And let me tell you something. You would be a shoo-in for the pitches. Oh, you really think so? Ah, sure thing, dollface. With your profile and your gams, there ain't a producer for a hundred miles that'd turn you down. Not with the boss's approval to boot. I don't know. I've had a few guys that wouldn't see me. Wouldn't even look at my picture. Ah, that'd be no problem. The boss, he always gets what he wants. And if he says you're in, you're in. And you know your Jackie's going to take good care of you. Jackie, baby, you're the greatest. Yeah, ain't I? Hey, waiter, I want some more of that salad from before, but don't put any of that green stuff in it. <laughs> Finally, after nearly an hour, the man called for the check. And then I saw something I never would have expected. The girl was the one who paid for it all. The man must have eaten three plates of shrimp and a bucket of fancy cheeses and caviar. And there he was, letting the broad pay for it all. Fine, keep it. Thank you, madame, and have a pleasant evening. Come on, baby! What are you waiting for? Let's go ball it up! I followed them out onto the streets. 
It was Friday night and some of the shows were just letting out, so the streets were littered with passers-by. I blended into them as best I could, always keeping my distance. I heard Jack going on about his boss, but not quite able to hear if he ever mentioned a name. Odds were this mook didn't even have a boss, and he was just giving this girl a sweet story to try and get some alone time with her. A couple of days or so, and she would demand to see his boss, and then he would reveal that he'd been playing her for a sucker the whole time. Then she'd cry and ask how he could do such a thing, and he'd, well, you know how that goes. Hey baby, I'm, I'm getting tired of walking. It's another three miles to my place. How'd you feel about getting a taxi? That'd be all right with me, sweetie. Yo, taxi, hey! Pull over here, why don't you? I knew if they got in that taxi, it was over for me. I don't care what they say in the movies. Jumping into another taxi and yelling, follow that cab, is a sure way to tell someone you're tailing them as just walking up to their face and saying it. I had to think fast. Hey, where are you headed, Mac? Hollywood. Lillian Way. I can take you as far as the end of Melrose. That's all the further I'm going tonight. I got a wife and a new baby to get home to. Are you kidding? It's only a few more blocks. I'll take you to the end of Melrose, but that's it. Take it or leave it, Buster. That'll be far enough. I'm sure we won't mind a little walk by then. Hey, did you say you were going to Melrose? Can I bum a ride with you guys? I'm going that way myself. Get lost, Pally. This is a private cab. Oh, come on, help a guy out. It's so hard to get a ride around here. Oh, that's too bad. Come on, baby, get inside. I- I'll pay for it. What's that? I-, I said I'll pay for the ride if you'll let me share it with you. All right, fine. Come on, then. You're holding up the works. Gee, thanks, mister. That's swell of you. Yes, sir, that sure was nice of you guys to let me share your cab. Yeah, I will skip it. Me and my girl was trying to have a conversation. Oh, sure, sure. You and your girl go right ahead and talk. Act like I'm not even here. Hello, miss. Hiya, kid. Gee whiz, you sure are a swell-looking dame. (laughs) Yo, wow. Oh, wow, you're awful lucky, mister. Weren't you going to be quiet? Shut up. Oh, sure, sorry. I I didn't mean to keep talking your ear off. People tell me I do that all the time. All the time people tell me shut up, and I listen to them. Yes, sir, Bob, when they tell me to shut up, I shut up. Uh... So, baby, when and where should I show up for the audition with your boss? What was his name again? Ah, he's got one of those fancy French names I can hardly pronounce. La Fenfru. La Fenu. Fenu. Something like that. Mostly we just calls him Mr. Sheridan. But I just calls him the boss, cause he's the boss. Seems to me I've heard that name somewhere before. Oh, I, I'm sure you have, baby. He's all over the town, he's got contacts with everybody. Gee, are you gonna be an actress, miss? Oh boy, I can't wait to see your face on the big movie screen. You're gonna be the biggest thing since Myrna Loy. Why don't you shutting up? All right, folks, here we is at the end of Melrose. That's as far as I goes. Get out. No problem, I'm just a short walk from here. Thanks, bub. What what do I owe ya? That'll be 75 cents. Gee, the prices sure have gone up since the crash. Here's a dollar, Mac, and keep the change. Oh, good. Now I can make that house payment. Well, thanks for the ride, guys. It was nice spending time with you. Would you like to grab a cup of coffee? I know this little place just around the corner. We just ate before we got in the taxi. You take a walk, short stuff. Oh. All right. See you later, folks. Come on, baby. My place is just over this way. Yeah, I might have overdone it, but you try coming up with a character and motive in all of 15 seconds. Maybe that taxi ride should have been the end of it. I knew now who the boss was, at least I had a name. And as for what was going to go on back at Jack's apartment, well, that was none of my business. Yeah, some poor kid was going to get taken advantage of, but that's nothing new. And you really can't stop it from happening. Some things people just have to learn for themselves. Yet there was something in me that just wouldn't let it go. I waited until they were out of sight before I turned around and followed them. I didn't have to stick close because I knew they were headed for Lillian Street. I took a couple of shortcuts and I was there before them. Next thing I knew, they were heading into a shabby apartment building. The kind of place I would live if I wasn't living out of my office. The kind of place that doesn't have a doorman or night security. I followed them inside and watched the elevator stop at the 14th floor. I rang for the elevator and followed them up.
I was concerned that I wouldn't be able to tell which room they had gone into. But that wasn't a problem. It wasn't a problem because I knew exactly where they were as soon as the doors opened. I ran down the hall to apartment 3, surprised no one else was sticking their head out into the corridor. Hey, this is security! What's going on there? Open up! That was it! I came into the room, but I saw the last thing I was expecting. Help me, mister! Help me! You tramp! You stupid tramp! Bit my neck! What the- Get me out of this! It's none of your business! The next thing I knew, I was flying through the air with the greatest of ease. But there was nothing daring about it. I slammed into the opposite wall so I'd been shot to a tank. This one's mine. Criminy lady, what are you? Some kind of reefer fiend? I lay there against the wall, my head swimming. The broad had thrown me against the wall. Like a spoiled little girl with a rag doll. At least that's what I thought had happened. Oh. But it couldn't be that way. Oh. It just couldn't. Oh. You're the Haze, I saw that screwy dame standing over Jack again, who was on his knees. She was holding him by his collar. Then she backhanded him as a cruel owner might backhand a disobedient hound. Where is he? Where's your boss? Where's Sheridan? I can't tell you. He'd kill me if he found out. I am going to kill you no matter what. All you have to decide is if you want your death quick and painless, or long and drawn out over multiple days. Just like your boss has done to those girls. The girls you helped him kidnap! Then you know? I know. I know. What do you think I am? You simpering little weasel, tell me! <sighs> Crazy broad. I'm getting out of here! Oh no, you don't! Get back here! Come back here! Get back here, Jack! Jack, stop! Get back here! You're gonna explain what just- Oh, you fool! You interfering little fool! Do you know what you've done? I just got rid of the last one, and now he's going to kill more. If I don't catch him, what comes after this is on your hands! The broad had me pinned against the wall by the throat with one hand. I strained and struggled, pulling against her arm. But it was like being held against the wall by a cast iron neck brace. One that was two sizes too small, and getting smaller by the second. Oh, and I forgot to mention that I was a whole foot and a half off the ground. She held me there like it was a five-pound sack of potatoes. I could kill you where you stand. You have no idea how much of an effort it's taking for me not to drain you dry. If I ever see your face again, you will never again see the light of day. Mind your own business! By the time I made it to the window, she and Jack were gone. I tried to climb to my feet, but I was so hurt from being thrown about the room that I just couldn't make it. I drug myself across the floor, pulled myself up onto Jack's bed. It stank like moldy socks wrapped around rotten cheese, and I was sure the sheets hadn't been washed in decades. But before I could even begin to process everything that had just happened to me, Darkness enveloped me, and I knew no more. Who was the beautiful woman that nearly ripped out Jack's throat and tossed Frank across the room like Lefty Grove lobs a third strike? Where can I find a dame like that? Who is Mr. Sheridan? And what are he and Jack doing with all those beautiful young girls? I can think of a few ideas. What's on special at Chasen's this Tuesday? And will Frank do the smart thing and be on the next train to Pittsburgh, running for his life like a dog on a fox hunt? The answers to all these questions and more on the exciting conclusion of The Factory Recording 741. In part two of Recording 741, the part of the mysterious woman was played by Miss Kendra Akers. The part of Jack was played by Mr. Jack Ward. The part of Bill was played by Mr. Sean Dugan. The taxi driver was played by Rick Spavero. And the part of Frank Cooper was played by Wesley Critchfield. The Factory Recording 741 is an original play written, produced, and directed by Wesley Critchfield. The producers of Club 40 Audio would like to extend a special thanks to Mr. Thomas Hogman for his assistance in this production. Please remember to subscribe, like, and comment below. Hello, what? Don't forget to subscribe to Club 40 Audio and support us in all that we do at Bandcamp.com. And don't forget to give us a like on the Facebook to keep up with everything Club 40 Audio. And consider becoming a Patreon. I don't even know what I'm talking about. The Factory is a production of Club 40 Audio, and all rights are reserved.
stay tuned for the adventures of Gracie Gravelplank and the Boy Wonder, following over most of these stations. <laughs>